telling you that after, after an introduction like that, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. What a pleasure it's been uh, being with you this weekend. Uh, Jude and myself have loved getting to know some of your leaders and particularly your pastors. It's been absolutely awesome. The guys have been incredibly kind to us. And uh, when we, I've been, without exaggeration, I, I've been to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches around the globe, probably well over a thousand different churches. Um, but I would say while we've been here learning a little bit about Destiny Church and the level of intentionality that you have about reaching into the community, touching people's lives, it's absolutely outstanding. And I want to commend you for that and the incredible diligence that you actually do that and the level of excellence that you go ahead to produce things so that people feel welcome, not only in this room, but in our lives, in our communities, and in, and in, your, and in your connect groups. That's just absolutely fantastic. And so I want to thank you so much for the opportunity of being here. My, my passion is to see heaven come to earth. My passion is how do we get Jesus in the community. My passion is that uh, I believe that there's an incredible time now in the life of uh, our nation where the gospel is ready to be received, ready to be received. And um, you may have been laboring for a little while and seen very few people or not as many people come to Jesus as you would like. I guess we're all like that. But I think we have to turn our hearts again to Jesus because I think we're on the verge of an absolutely amazing, amazing openness in people's hearts and lives to the good news that we carry and the good news that we bring. And so this morning I want to talk, I want to, talk to you for the next three or four hours on a, on the com, on a community, a community changing church. What does a community changing church look like? I'm going to turn to you to Nehemiah and chapter 2. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I never before appeared sad in his presence, so the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I said, long live the king. How can I not be sad where the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? And with a prayer to God in heaven, I replied, if it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, and if it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province of the west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter to address to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it uh, to make beams for the gates of the temple and the fortress and for the city wall and for the house and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of my God was upon me. When I came to the governors of the province of Euphrates, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, uh, the king I should add, sent, sent a long army of officers and horsemen to protect me. But when Sambalad the Hornonite and the Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. If you've been around church a little while, you probably know some of the context of those verses. And the city of God, the place of God had been destroyed. Um, the people had been carried into Babylon. It was a very challenging period. The Bible says in those days there was, there was a group of people called the sons of Ezekiah. And Ezekiah were people who understood the times and they knew what they should do. 
And I want us to understand the times which we're actually in. It's not business as usual. The COVID, as COVID crisis, as we sometimes describe it, has thrown up incredible amounts of opportunity. And it's not business as usual. It is quite unique and special, this moment that we find ourselves in the history of our nation. But Ezekiah were people with informed minds, ready hearts, submitted spirits, and they were committed to the task. To see the people of God and his uh, temple, his uh, city be rebuilt, Jerusalem being rebuilt. They wanted to bring the glory of God back into community. There, there are three or four things I want to share with you this morning. I don't know if we're going to get to them all, but let's just start with one anyway. We need to understand there are times and seasons in God's economy. There are times and seasons in God's, God's economy. You see, God sometimes has delays. In verse 1 of chapter 1, it was in the month of Kislev that Nehemiah began to pray about his city. But it wasn't until the month of Nisan, in, the, in uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, that is April, that God began to work. And did you know there are sometimes divine delays in some of the processes? Sometimes we want God to be on our calendar, but He wants us to be on His calendar. And there are sometimes delays in the purposes and the plans of God. Ecclesiastes says there's a time for everything. The Bible says it's with faith and endurance that we inherit the promises. Jesus did very little for 30 years, but he accomplished what God sent him to do in three years. David came to the throne as a teenager. Uh, uh, sorry, he was anointed to be king as a teenager, but did not come to the throne until he was 30 years of age. There are times and seasons in God's economy. And we have to understand that, because if we don't understand that, we will be incredibly frustrated with what is not happening, or what is not happening in the timeline that we think it should happen. You see, Nehemiah, in this passage, he's overcome by the need of Jerusalem. He's seeing the city broken down. And of course, here we are in Stockton and Pontes. This is a city. There's many aspects. It looks like it's coming alive, it's, it's, it's coming good. But in the city, there are many people that are broken down. There are many people in incredible need. There are many people who actually need to have an encounter with God. But Nehemiah had managed to conceal his need and the burden of his heart until on one point he appeared before the king and the king asked him, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? you not sick? Well, you didn't show your feelings before the king, right? You were in his court to make him happy. You were to tell good jokes. You were, you, you were to have good music. You were to take, lift the burdens of the empire off him. But here, Nehemiah had, had arrived in the, the, the uh, courts of the king, and he was deeply, deeply moved. Can I ask you how... Deeply moved, deeply moved, are you for Stockton upon Tees? Deeply moved. So deeply moved that you would make yourself uncomfortable to be an agent of God to bring his kindness and his goodness and his mercy. You'd inconvenience your week. You'd inconvenience your day. You'd inconvenience your time. You would miss your favorite program because you are so concerned about people in this community and ha that they need. To let well, Nehemiah found himself in that situation. I think it was Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, said this, to be significant in God's purposes you have to ask God what's breaking his heart, then ask him to break yours. You see, there was, there was a prayer foundation set for the ministry that Nehemiah was about to launch. We don't have time to go through the prayer, but in chapter 1, verses 4 to 10, he begins to call upon the name of the Lord. So he prays, he prays in chapter 1, but God doesn't answer till chapter 2. He prays in chapter 1, but God doesn't answer until chapter 2. 
He prays in chapter one, but God doesn't answer till chapter two. I, I, I don't know if you understand in the message. He prays in chapter, sometimes prayer is not instant. Prayer does not always happen immediately. It's not the clicking of the fingers, bang, bang, bang. Put the money in the, in the slot machine, get your coffee out of the bottom. Prayer doesn't work like that. Oftentimes prayer does not work like that. But he had prayed. And I think I'm in a room of people that have prayed. You have prayed. And do you know what? It's not been wasted time. It's not been wasted energy. It's not been wasted emotion. You've actually began to wrestle with the principalities and powers and demonic forces that are trying to contain what God wants to do in this city of yours. You have prayed. Let me tell you, it's not over yet. It's not fully started yet, but it's not over yet. It's not over yet. You've actually laid an incredible foundation for the plan, for the purposes, for the goodness of God to flow through this city. Prayed in chapter 1, didn't answer in chapter 2. Second thing I want to say is this. There are ways and means in God's economy. Because he prayed in chapter 1, and God answered in chapter 2, the unexpected happened. <laughs> the king noticed his face. The king couldn't be care two hoots. He couldn't get hoots about, his, about the, the people in, in his courtyard. He couldn't get hoots, but somehow, somehow he noticed the face. He noticed that but one of his courtiers were very, very sad. That, that's quite unbelievable. And you see, as we begin to pray, the unexpected begins to happen. Can I ask you, is the unexpected beginning to happen? <laughs> If the, if the unexpected is not beginning to happen, probably you need to go back and pray some more. Because an outcome of praying is the unexpected begins to happen. Now, you, you may find this difficult to believe, but I used to have a proper job. I did, I had a proper job. I worked in a city called Cardiff. Cardiff is the capital of Wales. You probably don't know this, but it's the capital of the universe. It's just, it's, that's how it is. And so... I work for a company called Pearl Assurance. And uh, I was a young kid, 17 years of age, first, first job in that kind of arena. Took the job to work for a year, saved some money to go to Bible college. Got into the, um, got, got into the, you know, the offices. It was a 13-story building. I think we was on level six. And um, my... my my prayer was, God, I want to speak to the boss of this regional pearl office. Now, that was a big prayer because some people didn't even know if he existed. Because he hadn't been seen for such a long time. There were cardboard cutouts of him, but no one actually had seen him physically. He was, he was in the monthly magazine, but no one had actually seen him for years and years and years. No one had actually seen him, and they were kind of doubting whether he was actually really there. But I said, oh, Lord, I really want to. I really want an opportunity to share my faith with Mr. Davis, with Mr. Davis. So I'm there seven months, eight months, handing my notice, months noticing, coming to the end, come to the last week, not seeing Mr. Davis. Wednesday of my last week, not seen Mr. Davis. Thursday, not seen Mr. Davis. At two o'clock, Friday afternoon, my phone rings on my desk. It was Mr. Davis's PA. He says, uh, Mr. Green, oh, that sounded good. I'd been called many other things in my life, but Mr. <laughs> Mr. Green, <laughs> that was unusual. Yes. He says, um, I am uh, Mr. Davis's PA. He would, he would like to see you. He would like to see you. So I go up and, and a 13 story palatial offices, three PAs had to get by to get to where he was working. Um, and, and then I get drilled by the PA. Okay, Mr. Green, you have 15 minutes and then you have to leave. Mr. Davis is a very busy man, he has a catalog of appointments and and you have to leave after 15 minutes. You understand? Yes, I understand. You sure you understand? So it was drilled into me. So I, I kind of got into this room. And uh, Mr. Davis said, oh, sit down. So, so Ian, you're leaving the company today. You're leaving the company today. Said, yes, yes, yes. 
I am. He says, well, look, we had plans for you. We had plans for you. We wanted to put you in a management track. Like, is there anything we can say today? Is there anything we can do today that you would change, that you would change your mind and, and not leave the company? I said, I, I, don't, I don't think so, Mr. Davis. He says, well, what are you going to do? He says, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to Bible college. He says, oh, sorry. <laughs> why, why, why would you do that? And then I begin to tell my story. And my time is coming up, but he's wanting me to continue. And I'm continuing. And do you know what? I was there for 57 minutes. Not 15 minutes, 57 minutes. And you see, when we pray, the unexpected can happen. When we pray, the unexpected can happen. I hope you're getting the message. When we pray, the unexpected can begin to happen. When we pray, the unexpected can begin to happen. In verse 4, when we pray, the unbelievable can happen. <laughs> the king said to him, what do you want? Oh, what a flipping question is that? What do you want? Remember, it was a question that, uh, that God said to Solomon. What do you want? What, what do you want? Can I ask you this one? What do you want? Like, what do you want? Like, I've discovered that lots of people, their God is so small, they ask so very little. What do you want? What do you want out of life? What's your purpose for having breath still left in your lungs? There's a reason for that. What do you want? This is what I want, right? And this is ridiculous, okay? This is ridiculous. But this is what I want. I want, I want to train 10,000 city transformers around the globe. That's what I want. I shouldn't be having those kind of dreams and visions at 65 years of age. I should be thinking of buying a hat by, on the beach and kind of retiring. Why would you want to do that? People who do that die in about the first 18 months. Why would you want to do that? Like retirement's not even in the Bible. No, you may retire from secular work, but you can never retire from the kingdom, right? And so I want, I want to see, I want to see 10,000 city transformers raised up across the globe. That's where I'm about. That's where I'm on. Two weeks from now, I'm with a bunch of people. We've created this curriculum that we can train business people and, and, and headmasters and, and, and uh, local churches and, and, and community leaders that they can see the kingdom of God come and a city transformed. What do you want? What, what do you want? Well, well, it'd be really nice. It, it'd be really nice if I could go to Scarborough for my holidays. That would be great. Holy, holy, holy. Come on, guys. Let's be a bit more serious here. What do you want? What do you want for your family? Those of you with family, some of you with grandkids, are you praying over your grandkids? What do you want? I've had an ambition in my life for our two children. Morgan's 23. Sophie's 26. I want them to become Holy Ghost terrorists. I want, I want when they wake up in the morning, the devil panics and he has to put nappies on. He says, oh no, oh no, they're flipping awake. They're going to wreck my plans. What do you want? For your kids, what do you want? For your grandkids, what do you want? What do you want for this church? Oh, we know it's a difficult morning this morning with the weather and whatever. And hey, those on online, you are welcome. I hope, I hope you're having a good time. And I'm hoping you're feeling very disturbed by what I'm saying. <laughs> I, I hope somebody then spilt their tea on the floor because they got moved by the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. Anyway, look, what do we want for this church? See, 
known a little bit about your pastors, it would be too insignificant to have this room filled with people. That would be too insignificant. So, well, that would be a nice start. Fine, but we're not stopping there, right? We're not stopping there. This room, this room can, can, can only be good enough, can only be good enough to train the leaders that we want to release into the city. <laughs> it's going to be too small for the congregation, right? What do you want? Hey, well, wouldn't mind the heating them up a bit higher. Wouldn't mind the heating down a bit lower. Wouldn't mind the music so a bit quieter. Wouldn't mind the music. Oh, my gosh. Give me a brain transplant. I can't cope with that. Look, we have one big life. Let's live it. What do you want for this church? What wakes you up in the morning? What, when you think about the church, when you think of destiny church, what prayer comes into your heart? What words come out of your mouth? Get them out of your mouth. Begin to declare goodness and blessing and power and life and glory and anointing and influence right across this city in Jesus' name. What do you want? What do you want for this community? Stockton and Pontes. What do you want? I was speaking in a city called Victoria in British Columbia several years ago. And, uh, and they had in their, I think it was in their province, not in their city, but they had about a thousand, a thousand children that were waiting to be adopted and there was nobody adopting them and this one single mum single mum decided to add two more children to her family single mum but she says that's not enough that's not enough we have enough churches in this province that if each church one family in its church adopted one child. Deal done. <laughs> Deal done. I want you to think outrageously. I want you to think totally off the charts. Look, for, for many years, I used that goal acrostics, acrostic goals. Anybody remember what the goal stands for? Anyway. The goal across it basically says, I just want a little bit more. I, I discovered some years ago, if you're going to have a goal, at least make it impossible. Like, if you're going to have a goal, at least make it impossible. Because if it's not impossible, then you don't need God to help you, right? But it is impossible. <laughs> You've got heaven to call upon. You got heaven to call upon. Say, oh God, give me wisdom, give me grace, give me insight. How we get this job done, God? How do we do that? How are we gonna how are we gonna move this thing forward in Jesus' name? They prayed in chapter one. And God worked in chapter two. They prayed in chapter one, and God worked in chapter two. And as he worked, the unexpected happened. As he worked, the unbelievable can happen. Now there was a guy in my youth group called Brian Burton, and uh, he married my PA when I was with Youth Alive, and they went to missionaries in Thailand. And you remember the Tusami some years ago, 2004? Tsunami, that's the one. Right, Tsunami, that's it. Thank you. Well, it, it wiped out Phuket dreadfully, right? They... They, their church building was a little inland and it was used as a bit of a hospital and rescue center. And, and Brian is walking around the city, meets up with the mayor, and he'd just become good friends with the mayor, and the mayor is gutted. He's absolutely gutted. Gutted. Saying, Brian, Brian, the school's gone. The school's gone. Without the school, we're guaranteed to have another generation of systemic poverty with our young people. Brian, would, would you rebuild the school for me? 
And he wasn't thinking, obviously not. He says, I'll do that, Mayor. I'll do that, Mayor. It's a, it's a school for a thousand students, right? I'll do that, Mayor. And then he walks away, and he wants to pee himself. He goes, oh my gosh, what the flipping heck was in my head? What, what came out of my mouth? He went down to the beach. There was debris everywhere. He says, God, you have to do something. You have to do something. I've said yes. I've said yes. And I've, I have no idea how we're going to do this. I've said yes. You, you, you've got to help me. So he walks back up from the beach, walks back into the town, and there's all these news news cameras started to arrive and he tells his wife Margaret and they, they pray together and, and, and he says, well, maybe we should at least set up a website or something and get that IT guy to help us out and let's get a, save a dom domain name. And, and then he goes back into the town and all these cameras there, CNN, BBC, World News, you know, everybody's there. And um, they, they catch that he's, he's from the black country, Lork, isn't it? He's from the Broyan. Brian's from the black country, and he's got one of these kind of accents like in it. And so they realized he wasn't Thai. Anyway, so they said to him, mate, what are you doing here? He says, oh, he says, uh, I'm, I'm a missionary. He says, well, what's one of them? Oh, well, we're here to help people, see people come to faith, blah, blah, blah. And he says, well, this is pretty devastating. He says, it is pretty devastating. And do you know what? You people can help me. You people can help me. He says, how can we help you? He says, look, I've just launched a website. Can't remember the name of the website. He says, look, we, we need to rebuild the school here. We need to rebuild the school here. It's for a 1,000 students. Without the school, there's just systemic poverty. is going to go on for another generation. We have to rebuild the school. Come get people to go to my donor page on that website and begin to give money to help us to rebuild Phuket. That was it. He walked away within three and a half weeks, 1.1 1, 1. 1 million pounds. That goes a long way. That goes a long way in Thailand, a long way. See, when you pray, <laughs> the unbelievable can happen. And maybe the unbelievable is not happening because we're not actually focusing prayer sufficiently, right? Because I know this, when we pray, when we pray, it causes heaven to move. Not at our speed, at his speed and at his time. But as we pray, it's like digging ditches, preparing for God to do his thing amongst us. Thirdly, when we pray, the unplanned can happen. Oh, now I know some of you, you don't, you don't even like this phrase, unplanned. Your life is so designed, so designed, you actually, you, act, you actually count how many times you stir your tea. And if you do one more time, you have a nervous breakdown. And, and if there's too many granules on the, oh my, oh my, oh my gosh. We're so organized, we're so, and we manage to put God in a box. But when we pray, <laughs> I hope this is going to inspire you to pray. But when we pray, <laughs> when we pray, the unplanned can happen. The stuff that's not on the agenda. The people that we never thought we were going to meet. The influence that we never thought we were going to have. As we pray, God does things we cannot even imagine. Now some of you will, some of you, have, some of you heard of his church? His church? His church is a large charity uh, based in Lincolnshire. Oh, that's a huge story by itself. Um, anyway, the founder of the charity, Trevor, um, they, they had been delivering tons of food every day. I mean, tons, like lorry loads of food. They made partnerships with all kinds of agencies. Um, they, they had an agreement with seven or eight um, police um, uh, agencies around the country, people that had made knocked off goods, you know, they looked like Gucci or they looked like whatever. They, they managed to get all that stuff for free, take the badge off Gucci and put a new badge on there called His Church. And so 
they're helping people all over the place. And then one day Trevor, Trevor is praying one morning and God says, I want you to help the people in Liberia. Says, Liberia? Don't you know where Liberia is? <laughs> Where's Liberia? So he finds Liberia, North Africa. And so he says, what do you want me to do? Well, they're coming to the end of a civil war and they need what you've been doing for people in England. You need to do that for the people in Liberia. He says, I don't, I don't know anybody in Liberia. He says, well, that's a good job. I do. I do. So he goes down to the office and he says to his PA, can you get the Liberian embassy for me on, on the phone? Well, Trev, why are you going to... No, just get them on the phone. What are you going to say? He says, I don't know. I don't know. Let's just find out what happens when they answer the phone. So it rings the Liberian embassy. Ambassador's assistant picks it up. Hello, this is Liberian embassy. He says, oh, very good. He says... Um, he says, my, 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 name is, my name is Trevor, and I feel I've had a message from God that I should come and help your people in Liberia. And the guy on the other side said, hallelujah, brother, praise the Lord. It was a Christian working in the embassy, right? So he says, well, can you, what do you want to do? He says, well, I think... I want to take truckloads of aid into your country. Like, I've got seven or eight trucks ready to go, but I need help. So, well, can you, can you come to the embassy? I said, I can come on Friday. So, I went to the embassy, got into the embassy, went into this palatial room. It was absolutely six star quality. It was just amazing. So, tells him what he wants to do. So, the guys, the the ambassador, meet him with the ambassador. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic, Trevor. That's that's. So he says, God, God told you to do it, right? He says, Yeah, yeah, God, God told me to do it. He says, Amazing, just just amazing. He says, Well, look, can you arrange all the paperwork for me? Because we've been on your website. It's complicated, man. It's it's like it's easier to go into the EU than go into your place. It's like really complicated. And so he said, no, no, we, we'll, do, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do all the paperwork. So as they're walking out just to leave the embassy, God speaks to Trevor and he says, I want you to fill this embassy with five-star furniture. Blink and neck, what's, what's five-star furniture? So he says, Ambassador, I've just... He said another message from God. <laughs> and um, this is what I think he's saying to me. He's saying to me, he wants me to provide five-star furniture for this embassy. But looking around here, I can't see that you need any. He said, no, no, you don't. He says, God said that. Yeah, God said, he says, he says, that is amazing, Mr. Trevor, because my predecessor, sold everything in the embassy, all the furniture, all the paintings, everything except what's in this room that we met in today. I sleep on the floor upstairs. I don't even have a bed. He says, God must have really spoken to you. Like, how lucky was that? That's what you call the luck of the Lord, right? See, when we pray, when we pray, the unexpected, the unplanned, the indescribable things begin to happen. Prayed in chapter one. God worked in chapter two. Oh, look at that. The devil's made my watch go very quickly. <laughs> I think we're out. I think we're out of time. Look, that's enough. You got two points? It's good enough, wasn't it? Two points, good enough. Look. This is what I believe. I believe Destiny Church. I believe, I believe, hearing into my spirit what was actually what your pastors told me what's happening in this city. This city 
is ready for a deluge of kindness and goodness and mercy and kindness and love and the goodness of God to break out all over the place. And I want to say, if, if you are a praying person, don't stop. And if, you've not, and if you're not a praying person, please start. For you to get on the train of what God is wanting to do in this city, get on the train of prayer because it's about to happen. It's about to happen. Look, I've brought some resources. I'm going to band back over to, to, to Pastor somebody, Bay or somebody, I don't know who I'm handing over to. But look, there's some resources there. I, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Checking Into Faith. Now, it may well be you already have too much faith, right? So if you have, if you have too much faith, this book is not for you, right? Because you'll overdose, you'll start walking on water, you'll start levitating before breakfast, and I'll help nobody, right? But if you're a person who says, no, no, I think I need more faith, I think I need, this book is available at the end, it's 15 pounds, and uh, there's about 40 stories. I told you three stories this morning. There's about 40 stories like that in this book. What's happened in our lives, how God has supernaturally intervened. You may find, that a, may find that a blessing. There are numbers of resources on there. There's one there called Extraordinary Living. Are you bored with living a normal life? And you finally want to become a normal Christian. Becoming a normal Christian means we live extraordinary. That's there available for you. How do we bring heaven down to earth? That's there for you. How to make your finances better? That's there for you. How to be a better leader? That's there for you. This is, this is my offer to you today. If you buy any two of these USBs today, <clears throat> I will give you a free book. I'll give you a free book. I'll sign the book for you if you want as well. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Trust you've been encouraged. Together, we go forward to win the city for Christ. Amen.